A couple of weeks ago, I kicked off a two-part video series talking about some retrofit ventilation upgrades I'm carrying out to my old cottage. In that video, I was talking about a super powerful oven hood fan and how this plays an important part in your whole house ventilation strategy. And in today's video, I'm going to be showing you how after the building regs told me I needed to put an extractor fan in this utility room, I decided to install a single room heat recovery system. Centralized heat recovery ventilation systems might be out of the range for us people living in old places like this, but with a bit of creativity, you can achieve a similar effect. I did a ventilation video a few years back covering our brilliant Ventaxia Savara bathroom fan, but with no backdraft shutter, it gets a bit chilly, which is great in the bathroom where I wanted to encourage ventilation. But in the kitchen that we've insulated to within an inch of its life recently with the SWIP breathable system, link on screen now to that video, I didn't want to put in any old extractor fan that would hemorrhage all that carefully preserved heat. But help was at hand. Sam on our Discord forum that you can access through Buy Me A Coffee or Patreon membership, there's a link in the description below, recently installed a BSK Zephyr single room heat recovery fan. And Hugh deserves a mention too because he was the first person to start talking about this fan. Now I don't know about you, but I find the terms that get banded around like DMEVs and MVHR pretty confusing. So I thought we'd go back to basics for a minute to understand the key concepts that are involved because then you will understand why today's install is so funky for an old property like this. We've got two concepts to grapple here. We've got decentralized ventilation systems as opposed to centralized on one hand and then we've got the simple extraction ventilation as against extraction ventilation with heat recovery on the other. Now, decentralized ventilation is something you'll be familiar with because pretty much all of us have at some point had a bathroom with an axial fan like this. Characterization of axial fans is they're meant to be this way up and they're meant to have very short duct runs through a brick wall. And so many bad installations happen because people try and put massive long duct runs on a fan like this. Now, if you've got the extra space and you've got a longer run for whatever reason, then you want to go with one of these. It's an inline fan, super powerful. Check out my video, link to which is on screen now, so that you can see the difference between all these fans and why this fan is so good. So that should decentralize hole in the wall systems. And whilst a lot of these fans are still triggered by light switches, timers, or humid stats, you've got a class of fan referred to as the DMEV, which is characterized by continuous running. My Svara, for example, can operate in either traditional mode, light switch, humid stat, timer, whatever, or continuously as you can toggle on trickle ventilation. You've then got centralized air handling systems, big units like this that I encountered in a new build down in Bath in my old day job, where you've got a great big unit that extracts the damp or dirty air from whichever room in the house via a series of ducts in the ceiling back to that central unit and then outside. Now, because of all the ducts that have to go in the ceilings, these systems are typically planned in new builds rather than old buildings like this. Now, you can add another element to these centralized systems when you talk about heat recovery, because these big air handling units typically have a heat recovery element. In short, the heat is taken out of the warm air being expelled and is put into the cold air coming in from outside. And some of these systems go a step further and have an additional heating element so that you're not losing any heat at all as part of the process. That's all well and good for these new build uh, systems, but we can't do anything like that in our old properties, can we? Wrong. And that's where today's installation is so interesting because systems like this are decentralized ventilation systems, but with the added heat recovery, you normally only get from those more sophisticated centralized systems. Now, BSK have got far more sophisticated visuals than me. So let's have a quick look at what this is all about. In the exhaust phase, device draws the air from inside for 70 seconds. The hot air transfers its heat to the ceramic heat exchanger core. In the supply phase, fresh air from outside is blown for 70 seconds. Previously charged ceramic core will help heat up the incoming cold fresh air. 
So that's pretty cool as a standalone fan when compared with your old bathroom extractor, but what makes it start to compete with the centralized systems we just looked at is when you pair up two units or possibly multiple units to create a network inside your house, working in parallel or reverse to allow you to create airstreams and up to 15 ventilation zones in your house. So put simply, half of the house is extracting air whilst the other half is supplying, which is far superior to your average DMEV, which has one-way extraction and is only as good as your ability to bring fresh air in to replace the air being expelled. There's so much love for PIVs in the comments below my condensation videos but they have the same problem that unless you have trickle vents all that air being forced in has nowhere to go and one of the concerns is that they can force that moisture behind any internal wall insulation that you've installed. So that's the boring theory out of the way let's crack on with the install. So the guys on the forum said you needed a 160mm hole. So what did I do? Go out and order some 160mm spiral duct. Totally unnecessary as it turned out, more on that in a minute. Again, you get a nice template to do that in the kit, which I later used to get the position of the electrics bang on. And I moved the hole to a more central location in the room after checking for studs with my super strong magnet. Now, if you watch my SWIP insulation video, you'll know there's an intelligent membrane behind the plasterboard. So I was keen to excavate as neatly as possible so as not to compromise the vapour barrier. And the multi-tool is brilliant for this. Next, I used a razor blade to carefully slice away that Intello membrane. And then with our best carving knife, I won't tell DIY wife if you don't, I carefully removed the insulation. And here's one for those keyboard warriors who said I'd still get interstitial condensation. No damp back there, it is cold, but it's not damp. Speaking of keyboard warriors, AP Mullen had a proper go at me for not using a cord drill bit to drill out the hole for my kitchen oven hood pipework. Well, he said I'm using DIY Dave tools. AP Mullen, don't give me that tool snob stuff. It's not the tools, it's how you use them that's important. And as I said, drilling out the hole my way takes about 20 minutes. I've tried to attack these super hard Victorian bricks with a core drill for previous ducts and I'm not going there again. I built in a gradual two to three degree slope to deflect outside any condensation and I reckon this is the neatest excavation I've done to date. I used a template in the instruction manual to pinpoint the entry point for the electrics, cut out a notch and then did a bit of fine tuning around that hole to make it absolutely perfect for the duct. Marked the 10mm overhang, trimmed the ducts down to size with my grinder and then sanded off the rough edges with my Dremel. I was anxious the new pipework didn't compromise the vapour barrier so I had an idea of using some of the tape left over from the insulation work around the edge of the hole. By moving the backing paper up a bit I could stick it around the membrane then push the duct through the hole and peel off the backing it works. paper thereby sticking the duct comprehensively to the membrane. And I've got to say it worked brilliantly. Next up, the fun bit of securing the pipe with this window and door SWS expanding foam. You must get yourself one of these guns if you haven't already and gun cleaner so you can keep the tip nice and clean after each use. There will be a link in the description. It's weird stuff this window and door foam. It's almost like they've packed it with a blue dye. But anyway, it cleaned up well with a razor blade once it had gone off. At this point I started unpacking the Zephyr and realised I'd been a bit of an idiot because the fan comes with a telescopic pipe so I didn't need to buy that 1.5 metre length of spiral duct. Not only that, the spiral duct I bought doesn't fit the outer wall fixture part because the plastic pipe supplied has a reduced diameter at the end. But I wasn't going to remove my spiral duct now, which I actually think is superior anyway to the plastic. So I made a series of cuts in the top half of the spiral duct to marginally reduce the diameter so I could slot the outer wall fixture part onto the duct. I could then fix the outer wall fixture part in place using the wall plugs and screws that come with a kit and finally fit the all important outer hood part. The hood is particularly important because as Sam on Discord is always at pains to point out, a system like this has a ceramic heat exchanger and 70 second cycles between exhaust and supply which will not work properly if it's not sheltered from adverse wind conditions outside. Let's have a mini review of this unit, which to give you full disclosure was kindly supplied to me free of charge by BPC Ventilation after I got in touch with them. They haven't otherwise paid me anything to mention them in today's video or had any input into it. You've got two removable air filter cartridges at either end of the capsule part. 
and a pretty impressive looking ceramic heat exchanger, which itself can be taken apart for cleaning. I think it's fair to say the whole unit has a real feeling of quality about it. Although I'm told the finer filters you get in MVHRs because of the increased power of those systems give you much better air quality. You can see the dust on this air filter after just a few weeks work and all this is is really just reticulated foam. The next part of the review I'm indebted to Sam on the Discord forum who's far more technically gifted than me. We've got a good quality servo motor that opens and shuts the hood and the suction passes the paper test even on minimum setting. We've got a buzzer and infrared receiver for that remote control, an ESP32, whatever that is, and a little address switch with the addresses printed on the circuit board, so someone who clearly knew what they were doing made this, and a low noise linear regulator, so all pretty impressive. The only downside in Sam's view is the Phoenix connector for mains input, which he thinks is pretty fragile, but I didn't have a problem connecting my mains, which I hasten to add was all wired in by my electrician. And back to the install. Now you do need that outer telescopic pipe as the capsule has a foam sleeve to ensure a snug fit with the pipework. So on balance I would have been better using this than my spiral ducting. But thankfully it slotted seamlessly into that ductwork. Well, I cut down some screws to ensure they wouldn't pierce my vapour barrier and used low penetration Fisher PD8 fixings to fix the inner wall fixture part in place. This fixture part is identical to the outer wall fixture part. Clever bit of manufacturing efficiency there by BSK. The capsule is obviously designed to be easily removable for cleaning and this just slots into the pipe. You just need to carefully align the fan electrical socket with the connectors before pushing into place. And that's it. There's an isolation switch on the side of the unit. I always like it when they do that. My Savara's got one. The cover opens and you're up and running. So with the infrared remote, you can activate night mode. You can choose from three airflow direction modes, set your humidity levels and choose from three fan speeds. But as is so often the case, you've got a lot more functionality when you delve into the app rather than relying on that remote control. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details on the app functionality right now because it can be a bit boring for you and you're probably losing the world to live by this point of the video anyway. But suffice to say, you've obviously got the three fan speeds and night mode that you've got also on the remote as well as the ability to change from exhaust to supply to cycle mode. And then if you delve into the settings, you can set a boost mode and a boost time. You can also set humidity boost so that you the fan works to achieve a certain relative humidity in the room. I haven't done that. Well, I did do it once, but the problem is when it's achieved that humidity setting you want, it, it reverts to exhaust mode and I forgot to turn it off. I like to have it in cycle, so I don't generally use that. You can also set weekly schedules, which again, I haven't bothered to do because I haven't needed to. I'll come on to that in a minute. And finally, in the advanced menu, assuming you've set up multiple devices, as we were talking about earlier on, you can access those and change the settings. And with multiple devices, I think you have to configure those address switches I showed you earlier. I don't think you can do it all through the app. And let's listen to the difference between the low, medium and high fan settings. Low. Medium. And high. I'd say high is not something you'd want going on in the background unless you had some serious humidity to shift. So I generally have it on, on medium the whole time and to be honest with you, I don't really notice. You can vaguely hear in the background, but it's not a problem. So why haven't I bothered to set weekly schedules or extra boost modes? Well, bottom line, I just don't think I've needed to. The uh, air quality in here is pretty good. My ThermPro hygrometer, which was originally showing 56% when we bought the Zephyr kit, is now down to 48. So you could say that's an 8% uh, reduction. I would say that my Drayton Weiser kitchen thermometer is showing 59% relative humidity as is the Zephyr. I think this isn't particularly accurate and the Zephyr humid stat is obviously influenced by being so close to all the activity. So this is the one that I would be most inclined to trust, but 50% is a really healthy relative humidity level. Now, clearly after what I've been saying, it would be much more efficient if that my Zephyr was paired with another one so that they could work to extract and supply in unison. I haven't got that, but what I do have is my Velux Active which I've now got a humidity sensor on and the window does open sort of a few times a day 
uh, depending on humidity and just to flush the air through and that's obviously going to give be an enormous benefit to my Zephyr fan particularly when it's in extract mode because as we all know extractor fans work much better when there's a window or some sort of trickle ventilation open so they're not trying to extract in a vacuum. So I thought I'd end this video by checking out the heat recovery functionality with my thermal imaging camera. Outside is reasonably interesting so this is the exhaust phase you've got a temperature of around about 15 degrees which I don't know maybe suggests the ceramic core is taking some of that 19 degree heat from the air being expelled from the kitchen. And in supply mode you'd expect it to be a lot cooler and it has actually yes gone down a couple of degrees between 12 and 14. So when we're ejecting air from the kitchen we're looking at about 18 what does that say 19.2 which is what you'd expect because the temperature in the room is about 19 degrees. And you can see that intense area of heat in the middle where that warm air is hitting the ceramic core. But switching to supply mode, this should be quite interesting. Exterior temperature of about 14 degrees. And we're showing an initial temperature. It'll probably go down as the core cools down, but that was about 16, wasn't it? It's now down to 15. 15.9, so around between 15 and 16 degrees. So the temperature here outside has been ranging between 11 and a half and 12 and a half degrees for the last sort of half hour. And so that's a sort of three degree approximate uplift uh, between the temperature outside and the air that's being pumped into the kitchen, which I don't think is too bad. So this has been quite an interesting video for me because I wasn't sure where it was going to go. But at the end of it, I've learned quite a lot about in-house ventilation and also just how effective this unit has been on its own, but how much more effective it could be if it was paired with another one. So hopefully that will give you a few ideas, a few pointers about how you can take some of the best elements of a centralised uh, ventilation system and apply them to your own property with this added benefit of heat recovery. Now this unit is £216 including VAT. There'll be a link as per usual in the description below the video. There are of course lots of other similar, well not lots, but there are so other units on the market. My good friend Andy Mack, Gosforth Handyman, has the care heat recovery unit in the outbuilding that he built and that is £323. It does look a lot more involved in terms of the sort of uh, the, the hardware of the kit. So I'll be really interested to hear from any of you who've got that system, how you're finding it, how you're getting on with it. And generally, let's continue this debate in the comment section below my video because it's been enormously helpful for me and lots of other people where people have waded in with their feedback on things like PIVs in my previous condensation videos. If you're new to my channel, it would mean a huge amount to me to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here. And don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all my future uploads. Thanks again for watching today and I'll see you soon.